So let's turn to Hebrews 11. We're on page 1210 in the Red Church Bible. Hebrews 11 verse 31 says, By faith the prostitute Rahab, because she wept and despised, was not killed with those who were disobedient. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice and gained what was promised, who shut the mouth of lions, quenched the fury of the flames and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weaknesses was turned to, to strength and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign enemies. Women received back their, their dead, raised to life again, others were tormented and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and floggings while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, and they were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskin and in goatskin, destitute, persecuted and ill-treated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. These were all commended for the faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. So we're doing one of our heroes of the faith today, and this morning we're, we're going to consider the, the life of Thomas Cranmer. You may not know the, the name Thomas Cranmer very well, but certainly his life has had a profound influence on the way we conduct ourselves even today in this church. Cast your mind back over the various bosses that you have worked for over the years. Think back about the good ones and compare them to the bad ones. I imagine the differences are vast. For, for myself, when I was teaching, I remember working at the very oppressive school in Newcastle, which to me felt like a prison. The, the head teacher was called Jimmy Smith, and he felt he was dour and critical. He found fault with everything and discouraged us all the time. He was intimidating to the children and intimidating to the staff as well. Compare that to when I was teaching in, in Papua New Guinea, where under an Australian head, the Australian head was generous with his time and encouragement. He listened to new ideas and encouraged us to work as a team. Because he was a Christian, he prayed for us and he loved us. The difference between these two men was massive. One brought out the best in me and the other one just didn't have a clue. One school felt like an oppressive regime while the other, I, ex I expressed a glorious freedom where the, the teachers and the pupils thrived. Do you relate to the bo different bosses that you've worked for? Well, multiply this by a thousand times and you may have some idea of what life was like in Britain 500 years ago. The Catholic Church was very oppressive to the people, but once the teaching from, the, uh, from Europe had come in about justification by faith alone from the likes of Calvin and Luther, then the people were able to enjoy a glorious freedom in Christ. Today we're doing one of our Heroes of the Faith studies because it's really important to, to know that the freedom we enjoy even today in December 2017 in Derby has been won by the blood of martyrs. We all need to understand that the, for the past 2,000 years, Christians haven't just turned up at church, sung some hymns, said some prayers and listened to some Bible teaching. The freedom we enjoy today is a blood-bought freedom. So today as we consider the life and influence of Thomas Cranmer, as I say, you may not have known know him, his name, but I can assure you he has had a proud, profound effect on your spiritual life and the life of even this church today. Thomas Cranmer is indeed a hero of the faith. And we'll, we'll consider this teaching under two headings. Number one, ping pong. And number two, 
strong and stable. So, ping pong. Before we get to the, the life and influence of Thomas Cranmer, I need to explain what life in Britain was like at the time for those who, 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 who worshipped God. Now, over in, in Europe, we had Luther and Calvin who were preaching their socks off, <laughs> telling people that they were justified by faith alone and that Christ was the head of the church, not the Pope, and that the Bible was the final authority over the practice of the church and its beliefs, not the Pope. Because of the Reformation, because of the work of people like Calvin and Luther, political boundaries were redrawn. Countries' boundaries were reshaped. Kings and queens fell because of this teaching of justification by faith alone. Over in Britain, at the same time, William Tyndale, he, he got uh, Erasmus's translation of the, 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 the Greek New Testament, and from that he translated the, the Bible into English and later into uh, some of the Old Testament from the original Greek, uh, Hebrew, Hebrew into English. And we heard last time that William Tyndale indeed was a hero of the faith in this land. And of course he was burned at the stake for his efforts. Now then, at the time that William Tyndale was translating... Who was on the throne? Henry VIII. Henry VIII was king while William Tyndale was translating. Henry VIII, when Henry VIII came to the throne in 1509, England had been a Catholic country for a thousand years or more. All of the, the Christianity history was centered around the Catholic Church. When he came to the throne England's Catholic roots were very, very deep. Henry VIII, he was a, an autocratic ruler. He had a lethal temper and, and he was like a coiled spring. He would explode upon people. He happened to be deeply religious. He went to, to the Catholic Mass three times every day. But it seems that the Catholic Mass didn't do much to rub off the rough edges of his personality. He heard about what was happening in Europe with Calvin and Luther and he intensely hated Luther's teaching. And so he even wrote a book called The Defense of the Seven Sacraments, which the Catholic Church stood by. And the Pope was so pleased with Henry VIII that he awarded him a medal. Henry VIII was awarded the title Defender of the Faith, which Henry was very pleased with. To receive. Henry had problems in his marriage though. He'd been coerced into marrying his brother's widow. Do you remember who his first wife was? Catherine of Aragon. Excellent educated people here. Catherine of Aragon was his first wife. He was coerced into marrying her, marrying her when he was only 17. It was an arranged marriage by his father. Now after several miscarriages, after several miscarriages and a couple of babies dying soon after birth, it appeared that Catherine was not going to satisfy Henry's deepest desire, and that was to have a son who would become his heir and take over as king. And when Catherine bore him a daughter that lived, whom we know as Mary, Henry was furious. But of course, the Catholic Mass had paid off. He consulted the Old Testament and he found out that in Leviticus 20, it says, if a man marries his brother's wife, it's an act of impurity. He has dishonoured his brother. They will be childless. And he took that as a, as a punishment from God that the, he wasn't being given this son. This was the way out he needed he, he decided that was a curse upon anybody who had married his brother's wife. And so he, he considered, because he only had a daughter, forgive me, politically incorrect, but let me tell you Henry's thoughts, because he only had a daughter, he considered himself childless, and therefore this verse was fulfilled. 
Well, he appealed to, to the Pope, Clement VII. He asked for a divorce, but that was refused. But that wasn't going to stop a man like Henry VIII. He set his team of scholars to work, and they came up with a brilliant suggestion. They found, as they dug deep in the history books, that apparently Joseph of Arimathea, you know, the one who offered the, the tomb for Jesus to lie in? Joseph of Arimathea apparently had come to England and, and set up the first church in Glastonbury. Therefore, the church in England was older than the church in Rome. Therefore, the church in England was not answerable to the church in Rome. And therefore, we had no need to listen to what the Pope said. That being the case, England was independent of Rome, and the head of the church in England was, guess who? The king, not the pope. And so, Henry passed a series of laws that severed links with England and the, the, the church in, in Rome. One of the first things he did was, as head of the church, what do you think he did? He granted his request for a divorce. Well, he would, wouldn't he? He granted his own request for a divorce. And, and so he, he divorced Catherine of Aragon. And the new Bishop of Canterbury was a certain Thomas Cranmer who married him to the very attractive Anne Boleyn. By 1534, the Act of Supremacy was passed. And the church in England was now independent from the church in Rome. And Henry proclaimed himself as supreme head of the church in England. Notice I didn't say church of England, the church in England. Henry was very happy with the, the, the Catholic theology, but he just wanted uh, essentially the Catholic church in England answerable to him. Remember, countries all over Europe were breaking ties with the Catholic Church for biblical reasons. Not Henry. His were purely selfish. So, as I say, Henry was, Henry was happy with the Catholic theology, but his new wife, Anne Boleyn, and his new Archbishop of Canterbury's were both evangelicals. They both loved the doctrine of justification by faith alone, and they had an influence upon King Henry. Henry removed the Catholic priests from the monasteries, and under Anne Boleyn's influence and Thomas Cranmer's influence, many evangelicals were appointed now as head of the monasteries. Britain was quickly becoming a Protestant nation. This is as, as dramatic as the change in Zimbabwe two weeks ago when Robert, Robert Mugabe resigned. You know, we know that's a massive change for the people there, where they're hopefully stepping out of an oppressive regime into freedom. This is what it like, was like for the religious life of the people. Stepping out from the oppressive Catholic Church <coughs> into the glorious freedom in Christ. There was trouble in Henry's marriage, though. Him and Anne Boleyn. Anne Boleyn gave him a daughter. Him a daughter, Elizabeth. And Henry was horrified when he heard that a daughter had been born. He jumped on his horse. He rode off to his friend's house, who was called Sir John Seymour. And there he decided to drown his sorrows. Now, while he was drowning his sorrows, his eye fell upon Sir John Seymour's attractive daughter, Jane Seymour. There we go, you're with me. His eyes fell upon the attractive Jane Seymour. So what did Henry do? He started rumours that Anne Boleyn had had an affair. He charged her guilty, sent her off to the tower and had her beheaded. Ten days later, Henry and Jane Seymour were married. And she gave him a son, Edward, the, his long, long 
uh, the dream, the thing he dreamt of for so long, the, his, the deepest desire of his heart, she gave him a son, Edward. Henry was delighted. This is probably the only wife that he really loved. And now he had a son. Everything was wonderful. But Jane died within a week or two from complications in the childbirth. So he, he married Anne of Cleves. But that, that marriage was never happy. It wasn't even consummated, so Henry had that annulled. So he married Catherine Howard. She was a staunch Catholic, and she was accused of having an affair, but this time she was guilty, so he sent her off to be beheaded as well. And Henry finally married Catherine Parr. Now, the first five wives... He was married to them all together over a space of 10 years. He's married to his last wife, Catherine Parr, for 25 years. Let me show you, oh, there's Catherine Parr. Let me show you a, a summary of the six wives. Number one, Catherine of Aragon, divorced. Number two, Anne Boleyn, beheaded. Number three, Jane Seymour, she died. Number four, Anne of Cleans, Cleves, Divorce or annulled, Catherine Howard beheaded, Catherine Parr survived. But of more interest, perhaps to us, is the faith of these ladies. Because Catherine of Aragon, his first wife, was a Catholic. Anne Boleyn was an evangelical and had influence upon him. Not, I'm not sure about Jane Seymour and Anne of Cleves. Catherine Howard was a Catholic. Catherine Parr, his longest wife, was an evangelical. This, this is good news. This is good news. Henry died in 1547. And so his son Edward became king. Hen Edward was only nine years old. And he reigned for six years up until he was 15 year years old. Despite his youth... Edward was thoroughly evangelical. He'd been taught by Catherine Parr when he was a boy. She, well, she, she arranged his tutors and she arranged evangelical tutors. So Edward was a raving evangelical. And, and remember, Thomas Cranmer was the, the, bishop, the, the Archbishop of Canterbury. So the, the two had a big influence upon the nation and they established Britain firmly as an evangelical nation. In 1553, Edward got sick and he died. When he was sick, he, when he, he, he was sick, he discovered his sickness was terminal. Then he drew up a device for the su succession in other words, he chose who was going to be uh, on the throne after him. And he appointed his cousin, Lady Jane Grey. Now, you, you probably know her name because she was only queen for nine days. She was another strong evangelical that Edward deliberately chose because of her faith. Trouble is, big sisters, Mary and Elizabeth were still around. Mary had La Lady Jane Grey beheaded. Mary took over. Do you remember whose mum Mary was? Catherine Howard, the Catholic. Mary was brought up as a Catholic. Catherine of Aragon, I apologise. Mary was the daughter of the Catholic Catherine of Aragon and Mary declared the Protestant church illegal. She had all of the Protestant priests removed and the, 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 the Catholic priests who had been in hiding for years, they came out of hiding and they took over the monasteries again. Thus the nation had gone from Catholicism to Protestantism. It now ping-ponged back under Mary to being a Catholic nation again. Now, the truth is, the ordinary people weren't particularly bothered. All they wanted was just to get on with their lives. They weren't too bothered. But 
Bloody Mary, as she was known, she ordered at least 300 evangelical priests to be burned at the stake. Many also died in dreadful prison conditions. It was like our very own ethnic cleansing in this nation. We need to understand that. It was, it was like our very own Holocaust in Britain 500 years ago. Five years later, Mary's only on the, the throne for five years. Five years later, she developed stomach cancer and she died. She had no children. So who should become, come on the throne after her? Her half-sister, Elizabeth. No picture? Uh, no, no picture. I, oh, how, how, how careless. Sorry. Elizabeth was crowned queen. And so we come on to the second point, strong and stable. When Elizabeth learned that her half-sister, Mary, had died, Elizabeth... Being an evangelical, she quoted the Bible. And she quoted from Psalm 118, verse 23, that says, The Lord has done this, and it is marvellous in her eyes. <laughs> she, clearly, grief overtook her at the death of her half-sister there. <laughs> Miraculously, the evangelical Elizabeth had been spared during the, in, the British Holocaust. And now at last the country could ping-pong back again to being a Protestant nation. Remember, a thousand years of Catholicism, then under Henry and Edward, Protestant, Catholic under Mary, and now under Elizabeth, Protestant again. And Mary established this as a strong and stable Protestant nation. The nation never ping-ponged back again after Elizabeth came to the throne. Within, the, her, within her very first year of being on the throne, Elizabeth undid all of Mary's religious reforms and proclaimed herself as the supreme governor of the church in England. Henry had been the supreme head, but they had, she had problems theological problems with calling herself the head of the church so she called herself the supreme governor of the church once more the monarch not the pope was in charge of the church in this land protestantism was now the strong and stable religion of our nation and elizabeth commissioned a, a, a prayer book to be written. The Common Book of Prayer was written and published. It was a revised edition because the original uh, edition of the Common Book of Prayer was written by a certain Thomas Cranmer, the Archbishop of Canterbury. Ah yes, Thomas Cranmer, we'd, we'd forgotten about him, hadn't we, as we were going through the kings and queens in the early 16th century. Thomas Cranmer. Now, I need to take you one or two steps back into the time of Henry VIII. Cranmer was born in, in the, the, the small town of Aslockton, just, just east of Nottingham City, so not very far from here, I'm guessing 20, 25 miles. He was born in, in Nottingham. He went, to Cam in, he went to Cambridge University where he heard Luther's teaching, justification by faith alone, that was sweeping all over Europe and he was converted whilst at university. Cranmer was summoned by Henry VIII to sort out his divorce, which he successfully did, and his reward for sorting out Henry's divorce. Do you remember Joseph of Arimathea established the first church here in Glastonbury? They said, well, his reward for finding out that little gem was to be... Uh, given the title of Archbishop of Canterbury in 1532. He personally crowned Anne Boleyn as Queen, and that was enough for the Pope to excommunicate Cranmer uh, from the Catholic Church. After Henry died and then Ed Edward became King, Cranmer went on to write his most influential book, as I've just said, The Common Book of Prayer, and it was revolutionary in its day. 
it required priests to take their lessons from the Bible alone, not from anywhere else. And of course, we continue that tradition today, don't we? Cranmer's common book of prayer included the orders of service for, for Sundays and for the daily services as well. It contained services for baptism, services for marriage and for funeral. It set out the epistle readings and the gospel readings to go through day by day and week by day, week by week. And if you've ever said words similar to these ones now, you have Thomas Cranmer to, to thank because Thomas Cranmer is the one who said, wilt thou forsaking all of us, keep the only two, himself, herself, so long as he both shall live, to have him to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for rich or for poor, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish till death us do part. With this ring I thee wed, those whom God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Have any of you said words similar to that? You have Thomas Cranmer to thank. He's the one who penned that. He could have written something entirely different, but he thought this was the most succinct way of expressing vows in a marriage service. And they still stand today, don't they? You see his influence carrying on 500 years later? Perhaps you've stood by an open grave and heard the words ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Cranmer's, Cranmer's words. He, Cranmer went on to write the 42 articles which were edited down to the famous 39 articles that the Church of England stands by. It was their clear statement of faith and showed many of the false teachings of the Catholic Church. He wrote about the authority of the scriptures being the supreme authority over, over the church and over all believers. He wrote about justification by faith alone in the 39 articles. He wrote that the Catholic teaching of transubstantiation, you know, where the Catholics believe the wine in communion becomes blood and the bread becomes the real body of Christ, Grandma said that's nonsense. No, it doesn't. He also taught that, the, that pilgrimages offering money to statues and saying prayers for the dead, they were now cancelled out. And the term mass was re removed from church services and instead uh, communion was no longer celebrated in, at an altar, which speaks of sacrifice, but it, it was at a table where we remember the death of the Lord Jesus. So this is all Cranmer's influence. You may not know his name, but his influence continues upon you today. It was him who, who wrote down that Mary should not be deified and that saints should not be prayed to. We have him to thank. Thomas Cranmer thrived under the reign of Henry VIII. He really thrived under the, the evangelical Edward VI. But as soon as Mary became queen and she took the nation back to Catholicism, she would have none of his teachings. A terrible persecution broke out across the land and many Protestants were, were burned at the stake. Cranmer was arrested by Mary, Queen of Scots. He was sent off to the Tower of London where he spent three years immense pressure was put upon him to recant his theology that the monarch was head of the church instead of the pope. And Cranmer cracked. He cracked. He, he went back on what he believed. He said, okay, can't stand this anymore. I'll accept the pope as head of the church. But he was sentenced to death anyway. Despite having recanted his beliefs, he was sentenced to death anyway. And he was tied to a stake with wood all around him. And as the wood was set alight, 
Cranmer thrust out his hand, his right hand, into the flames because the right hand had held the pen which recanted his beliefs. And he said, oh, this wretched right hand. And he had his right hand burned first. And then, whilst tied to the stake, he, he, he said, no, the, 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 the Pope is not head of the church. It is Christ. And his final words were, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. At the beginning of my message, I read from Hebrews 13 that said, reading from verse 37, if you still got your Bible open, the writer that Hebrews, verse 37, writes about they were stoned, they were sown in two. That was probably Isaiah he's speaking about. They were stoned, they were sown in two, they were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskin and goatskin, destitute, persecuted and ill-treated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what they'd been promised. God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Thomas Cranmer stood by these verses and reflected upon them that he had now joined this illustrious group those who were still stoned <coughs> sawn in half and now him burnt at the stake burnt at the stake because of his faith in the Lord Jesus Cranmer read these verses and he believed them you know for, for you and I Things happen in our daily lives which are wonderful. Things happen in our daily lives which are heartbreaking. And we, we don't know if we can carry on. We look one way and we're thrilled. We look the other way and our hearts are breaking because of the circumstances of life. That, that, that was Cranmer's experience. I'm sure it's all of ours as well. So the thing we need to hang on to is what the writer to the Hebrews goes on to say in chapter 12, verse 2. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. What we need to do when things get tough in our lives is to hang on to Jesus. We need to fix our eyes on Jesus. That's what Cranmer did and it took him to the end. That's what Isaiah did even though Jesus hadn't been born yet. He was looking forward to something better. But as it says uh, in verse 39, chapter 11, they were commended for the faith that they did not receive what they'd been promised. They were promised a saviour. But the saviour in the days of Isaiah had not come. In our day, the saviour has come. And so we look to Jesus. And we look to Jesus when, the, when we are thrilled. We look to Jesus when our hearts are breaking. Because no one can take away our faith. No one can take away our faith in Jesus. God has planned something better for these Old Testament heroes of the faith, and that is Jesus, and he's planned something better for us, that is a resurrection, a glorious resurrection with Christ in the new heavens and earth where things will be perfect forever. Despite the hardships of our lives, we stand on the shoulders of those who've gone before us, and we, we can be encouraged to know that if they persevere to the end, so can we. We're not likely to face the same persecution as Cranmer and the other evangelicals 500 years ago. We're not likely to face that. But we're still going to face tough times for our faith and sometimes irrespective of our faith. But we hang on. 
This is why we're studying the heroes of the faith. So we can see how other people persevered to the end. Well, if they did, so can we. If they did, so can you. You can persevere to the end, knowing that God is working behind the scenes for his glory and for your good. God was on the throne when Cranmer was around through the good times and bad times, and God is on the throne through your good times and bad times. God is on the throne, and Christ is at his right hand, reigning forever, and he loves you very much. He loves you very much. So be encouraged. Hang on tight to the promises in Scripture. Fix your eyes on Jesus, who's promised he will never leave you or forsake you. For he is indeed a wonderful Savior. And there we will stop.